Today we're going to look at question four from the A-level paper that was sat in June 2015 for the OCR board, a question regarded by many as one of the most difficult A-level chemistry questions yet asked. So let's take a look. A student reacts compound K with 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine. An orange precipitate L was formed. We've got the equation for the reaction there. The student purifies the orange precipitate L and sends the sample for analysis using H1 NMR and C13 NMR spectroscopy. Right, so just a quick observation. Uh, so 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine, uh, you might know that um, more commonly as 2,4-DNP. Uh, and the reason uh, that we use this substance is that we can react it with carbonyl compounds. So it reacts with aldehydes and it reacts with ketones. Um, and when you do that reaction, uh, you get an orange precipitate, okay, or, or precipitate that generally has an orange colour. Uh, and you can do a couple of things with that. Okay, so the fact that you've got an orange precipitate is evidence that the original compound uh, was either an aldehyde or ketone. But you can also go a step further. You can take this orange precipitate and you can purify it and you can measure the melting point. And using the melting point, you can look at a database of information. Uh, and that can be used as good evidence for working out what this original compound was. Okay, uh, so when you do this reaction, you do get a good range of melting points, depending on what the starting material was. Uh, and obviously, if you purify it, that melting point will be quite sharp. Uh, and it used to be a good way of identifying aldehydes and ketones. Right. Um, so yes, the students purified compound L uh, and they've analysed it with H1 NMR and C13 NMR spectroscopy. So describe a use for NMR spectroscopy in medicine. So the answer is MRI and that stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. State the region of the electromagnetic spectrum used in H1 NMR spectroscopy. So the answer is radio waves. Uh, and radio waves are around about 100 megahertz. Explain why CDCL3 is used as a solvent in H1 NMR spectroscopy. So CDCL3 is otherwise known as deuterated chloroform. The hydrogen atom, the H1, in chloroform has been replaced by its heavier isotope deuterium, uh, which has a, a neutron and a proton in the nucleus rather than just a proton. So the reason for that is that this solvent does not contain any H1 nuclei that would interfere with the NMR. Okay, so obviously if the solvent contained H1 nuclei, that would be picked up in the NMR spectrum uh, and it would just make it difficult to interpret. The C13 NMR spectrum of L is shown below. How many different carbon environments that's types of carbon, are present in a molecule of compound L. Okay, so C13 NMR, its main use is in determining the number of different carbon environments. It's very simple. All you do is you count the number of peaks in the spectrum. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we've got 14 peaks and therefore there are 14 different 
carbon environments. Remember that in C30 NMR, peak height is of no significance. Over the page. The reaction of K to L is repeated below. Okay, so it's exactly the same reaction as we saw on the previous page. Uh, and we've got precipitate L here. So the H1 NMR spectrum of L is shown below. Use your answer to C and the data given to identify R1, R2, and the structure of compound L. Explain how you used the chemical shifts and splitting patterns in the H1 NMR spectrum and any evidence from the C13 NMR spectrum. In the 1H NMR spectrum, uh, this group of atoms would have a peak in the range delta is equal to 1.6 to 2.2 parts per million. Right, so this part of the question is worth seven marks. And the trick with this sort of question is to start by arranging your thoughts in an ordered way. So, I would recommend drawing this table. Okay, uh, and this is a really useful strategy for most NMR problems. Uh, it's quite a methodical way. It's a very clear way. Uh, and it's very useful in this case because um, you can order your thoughts quite easily. So all I've done is I've gone through the NMR spectrum and... Uh, and I've added these chemical shift values. So if I just bring back the NMR. Okay, so you can see I've got a group of peaks here uh, that are around about 7.3, 7.4 parts per million. I've got a peak here at around about 5.3, 5.4 parts per million. I've got a group of peaks here at around about 2.3, 2.4, 1.8, and 0.8. And that's all I've got in this column here. Right, in the next column, the H1 environment, this is where I would write down the type of environment that those H1s were present in. Okay. Now, we're not going to worry about that yet. Let's have a look at this call, the peak ratio. Okay, so the peak ratio in H1 NMR, uh, the peak heights, or more correctly, the integration of the peaks is significant. And you can see that in this situation, they've told you what the integration is above each of the groups of peaks. So seven, one, two, three, and three. And all I've done is put that here in my table. Okay. And you can see that I've got various other titles at the top. Okay. So I haven't even started to answer the question. All I've done is I've rewritten the question in a more organised and methodical way that I can easily understand. So let's have a look at the question more closely and see if it gives us any more information. So I have an NMR spectrum here and I know that in H1 NMR the peaks become split and the splitting of those peaks is significant and contains useful information. Okay, So if we look at this group of peaks here it's a bit of a mess. Okay, and when you have a situation like that, there's a special word that we use. So we would call that a multiplet. Okay, 
Okay. So there's obviously something quite complicated. Uh, there's no clear binomial pattern. Okay. So I would just call that a multiplet. And that's just a general term for a peak that's split, but in no simple way. This is a singlet. This pattern here of four peaks in the ratio 1, 3, 3, 1 is a quartet. That's a singlet. And this pattern here, 1 to 2 to 1, is a triplet. So I'm just going to write that all into the table. So I've got a singlet at 5.4 parts per million. I've got a quartet uh, at 2.4 parts per million. I've got a singlet at 1.8 parts per million. And I've got a triplet at about 0 0.8 parts per million. Okay. So the peak splitting is what we call the multiplicity. Uh, and at A level, you know that the multiplicity is equal to the number of neighbouring H1s plus 1. So we can work backwards from this to work out what N is. Okay, so the number of nearest H1 neighbours. So in the case of the multiplet, okay, we can't do that. We said that was quite a complicated peak pattern. But a singlet would be zero. A quartet would be three. A singlet would be zero. And a triplet would be two. Okay, so you can see that if n is equal to two, then n plus 1 would be 3, and that would give me a triplet. Okay, so all I've done there is I've just worked backwards from these splitting patterns and worked out the number of H1 neighbours. Okay, so let's have another look at the question and see if we can get any more information to fill that table. So if you take a look at this line here, uh, they've told you that if you had this series of atoms, it would give you a peak in the range 1.6 to 2.2 parts per million. So if we have a look at our table, we do indeed have a peak uh, in that region. So this is the environment here that we can identify. Okay, now looking to see what else we can do. Well, we know that the peak ratios tell us the ratio of H1 nuclei in each environment. Now, most of the time, the peak ratio is the same as the number of H1 nuclei. Okay, and as a starting point, that's not a bad assumption to make. Now, down the line, if we find that it doesn't work, we can easily go back and change it. But to start with, let's keep it simple and just assume that the peak ratio directly reflects the actual number of H1 nuclei. So let's say that we have seven H1 nuclei in this environment. One, two, three, and three. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned so far, I haven't really had to do very much. Okay. All I've done is I've written a table. I've added the information from the question. Okay. Uh, and I've extended it. Okay. Here in a simple way. Uh, I've added a detail from the question here, uh, and I've made a reasonable assumption with these H1 um, 
numbers. Okay, so all I've effectively done is just written the question. I've pulled all of the information together into a nice condensed table. And now I can see all of that information together at a glance. And now I'm in a much stronger position to be able to move forward and try and identify what this molecule is. Okay, so really, the answer to this question involves taking three pieces of information together. Okay, the first piece of information uh, that we're going to be using we actually came across back here. So we know that compound L contains 14 different C13 environments. So here's compound L again. We know that that contains a total of 14. So we just write clue one. We know that it contains 14 13C environments. All right, so I've got six carbons in that benzene ring. Okay, and they're all different. And I've got a carbon there. So that's seven. So that means that R1 plus R2 must contain between them seven C13 environments. Okay, now that doesn't mean seven carbon atoms necessarily. It means seven different types of carbon. Okay. So I've got the structure of the molecule. I can see there are six carbons there. I can see there's a carbon there. We know that we have to have 14 different carbon environments in total. All of these carbon environments are unique. And so that means that R1 and R2 must between them have seven carbon-13 environments. So that's the first clue. The second clue is to do with this peak here. Okay, so this region up here tends to be where you see benzene. Okay, so anything involving a benzene ring tends to have quite a high PPM value. Okay, now another clue is that we've got quite a lot of H1s in that environment. So that to me is an alarm bell that it could be something to do with a benzene ring because we know that that contains lots of hydrogens. And the final clue is this multiplet. So the NMR spectrum of benzene and other aromatic um, compounds is quite complex. Okay, and it leads to very complicated splitting patterns. Okay, so those three pieces of information between them indicates to me that this is probably aromatic. Okay, so something to do with a benzene ring. Okay. Now, if we go back to precipitate L, well, I can see that I've got a hydrogen there and a hydrogen there and a hydrogen there. So there are indeed aromatic hydrogens, but I can see only three environments. Okay. And there are only three hydrogens. And yet, here, 
we've said there are seven hydrogens. So that means that either R1 or R2 must contain a benzene ring. because otherwise the numbers don't add up. So R1 or R2 must somehow contain a benzene ring. And we can also say with four H1 nuclei. Okay. Okay, let's see what other information we can get from this. So, Looking at this, uh, I'm going to look at this line here. So they've told us in the question that we've got this sequence of atoms. Uh, I've got three H1s with no hydrogens on the neighbouring carbon. And this combination of three here and zero here is a good one to know because it indicates that you've got a methyl group next to something that doesn't contain any hydrogens. Okay, so that's just a good one to know Whenever you see a 3 here in this column and a 0 here, there's a fairly good chance that what you are looking at is a methyl group next to a carbon that does not possess any hydrogens. Okay, And actually, if you look at what they've given us, that makes sense. Because if I put a bond there and a bond there, okay, I have a methyl group, so a CH3 and next door, the carbon does not have any hydrogens. Okay. So, we have actually identified what one of those R groups is. Okay, so we'll just sort of say that we've worked out R1. So R1 must be CH3. Okay. So R1 is CH3. Okay. So you can see we've got that sequence there. And that is consistent with R1 or R2 being a methyl group. Okay, so finally, is there anything else that we can get from this? Okay, so we've looked at that line and we've looked at this line. This line here Okay, so we've got a peak ratio of one, so one hydrogen, and it's a singlet with nothing next to it. So again, this is just a good one to know. Whenever you have one hydrogen with no um, hydrogens on the nearest carbon, chances are that it's probably something like a hydroxyl functional group or in this case, an amine functional group with only one hydrogen. 
Okay, so that's that hydrogen there. So all I'm going to do is here, I'm going to add N H. And that's us. Identified that line. So I've got two lines remaining. And this is a third pattern that's just quite useful to be aware of. So I've got two hydrogens and I've got three hydrogens. And if you look at the neighbouring hydrogens, I've got the same numbers but swapped round. And that is an indication that those two environments are adjacent to each other. So I've got a two and a three here, and that's reflected in the two and the three nearest neighbours here. And so that indicates to me that I've got, and we'll call this clue four. So that indicates to me that I've got CH3, CH2. Okay, and so if I draw that out, that's a displayed formula. that is consistent with that NMR. Okay, so I've got an environment that contains three hydrogens, and if you look next door, we've got two nearest neighbours. And here I have an environment with two hydrogens, and next door you can see I have three nearest neighbours. So again, that's a good pattern just to be aware of. Okay, that here. That three and two. Okay. And so I can just fill out the rest of this. So it looks to me like all we've got is a alkane um, type grouping. Uh, and that is what I have here as well. Okay. So, we've looked at this table, uh, we've filled it out, we've looked at every line, and we've been left with this information. Okay, so we've been able to work out uh, that R1 is a CH3, so a methyl group, so we don't need to worry about that anymore. But what about R2? Okay, so if I just take some paper and cover up clue number three, because we've already dealt with it. you can see that I've now got three pieces of information that I can use to work out what R2 is. Okay. So we know uh, that R1 and R2 have to contain a total of seven C13 environments. We know that R1 is a methyl group so that therefore means R2 must contain six carbon-13 environment. Now, we know that R1 is a methyl group. So that means that R2 must contain a benzene ring with four H1 atoms. 
Okay, and we got that from the integration trace. So, what we have, if we summarize this now, So, R2, we know that it contains a benzene ring with four H1 nuclei. We know that it must contain six carbon-13 environments. And we know that somewhere it contains this sequence of carbon atoms. So let's take this information and start with the benzene ring. And we know that it contains this somewhere, so it doesn't actually matter where we put that ethyl group. And so now the question is, where would that molecule attach itself to the rest of the compound? Okay, well, there are three options. Okay, so if it was to attach itself here, that would mean that I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different carbon environments. So all of those carbon environments would actually be unique if that part of the molecule attached in that way on that carbon there. If this was to attach to the rest of the molecule here, again, all of those carbon atoms would be unique and that would give me eight C13 environments. But if I was to attach it here using this top carbon atom, you can see now I have a plane of symmetry. So there's one carbon environment, two, three, four, five, and six. And so that must be where it attaches to the rest of the molecule. And actually, you can see that the final piece of evidence now makes sense because there are four hydrogen atoms in that benzene ring, which is what we predicted previously. Okay, so that means that R2 must have that structure. And so now, if we take all of the information we have together, we can now draw the structure of orange precipitate L. So we've got carbon double bonded to nitrogen. We've got a nitrogen here and a hydrogen. We've got a benzene ring, NO2. O, two, N, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So we've identified that R1 was a methyl group. And we identified that R2 had this structure.
And there you go. That is the structure of compound L. And the final part of the question, trivially, they've asked for the structure of the original ketone. Well, all we can do is if we cover up that side of the molecule, look at that double bond and stick an oxygen on it. So if I do it like that, that is the structure of the original carbonyl compound. So it's a very difficult question. It's worth a lot of marks. But just to summarise, the trick when answering these types of problem solving NMR questions is to always start by writing out this table. Okay? It organises your thoughts and it gives you a really firm basis for being able to answer the rest of the question. And that would be my best recommendation when solving this type of problem. Thanks for watching.